got his Bachelor of Science in Physics from the MIT in 1918, 1982. and got his PhD in theoretical physics from Harvard University in November 1985. Professor Sajda uh, on the many honors. Let me just uh, uh, list the three of them. First of all, he uh, won the Osaka Prize in 2018. The reason for uh, his winning is as follows. It says that for his seminal contributions to the theory of quantum phase transitions, quantum magnetism, and uh, fractionalized spin liquid, and for his leadership in the physics community, Professor uh, Sachdev won the Dirac Medal for the advancement of theoretical physics in 2015. The Dirk Medal was awarded to Professor Sachdev in recognition of his many seminal contributions to the theory of strongly interacting condensed matter system, quantum phase transitions, including the idea of critical deconfinement and the breakdown of the conventional symmetry based Landau Ginzburg Wilson paradigm, the prediction of exotic spin liquid and the fractionized space and the applications to the theory of high temperature superconductivity in cooperative materials. Professor Seidelf is also a member of the US National Academy of Science from 2014. With this kind of uh, many honors and the great achievements, I think uh, Professor Seidelf is a no better speaker for uh, the topic which is building strange matter from uh, SYK model. Let's welcome. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, should I use the mic or yeah, just stand here? All right. Okay. So uh, so now I'm going to talk about something quite different. Uh, this is also motivated, at least for me, by studies of the high temperature superconductors, uh, so-called strange metal phase, uh, which I will just define for you a little bit later. Uh, but it's this topic of what I call the SYK model has acquired a, a lot of interest in the past few years uh, from string theorists, something I never expected when we first proposed the model with my first student, uh, Jin Nguyen, in 1993 which is 25 years ago now. Uh, I never dreamt at that time that somehow this model would be of interest to string theorists, but uh, I'll try to explain why it is and why it's turning out to be, have captured some aspects of the quantum physics of black holes. Uh, this, you know, the ADS, it's the famous ADS safety correspondence of Bardesena was uh, proposed in 1997, I think, which is four or five years after the SYK model, so we couldn't have seen that connection at that time. But combining with the AADC, this is, it turns out that there is a, the SYK model encapsulates a simpler version of what's called the ADS CFD correspondence that allows you to uh, not only study gauge theories using gravity, but also study gravity using quantum mechanics. It goes both ways, unlike the usual ADS CFD correspondence, which typically only helps you go one way. All right, uh, so that's what I want to explain to you today, uh, some of these recent developments. But I'm going to keep it very simple uh, in the beginning uh, and just tell you my original motivation of where this model came from. Uh, and the original motivation, uh, of, before I go there, I, some of my recent work is uh, in collaboration with various people. Uh, there's uh, Wen Ho Fu, uh, my current student at Harvard who's just leaving and uh, going to La Jolla. Ying Fei Gu is a postdoc at Harvard, and uh, Risha Tarnopolsky is also the postdoc, and Avishkar, my current student, uh, well, I'll mention some of his work later, and two people at Tarnopolsky. Uh, yeah. All right, 
So the, the, the key idea of almost everything in condensed matter physics uh, is the quasi-particle. Uh, and uh, it's simply a generalization of three particles where you think of each particle uh, being replaced by a lump, which has uh, some of the same quantum numbers in the quasi-particle. Maybe it has a different mass and uh, it has uh, some kind of backflow around it, but it's really just a particle that's uh, moving in straight lines. Okay, so the picture is nice, but let's try to be a little more precise. Uh, but really, but I should remind you before I try to be a bit more precise, uh, that it's the assumption, quasi-particle assumption is so free, so frequent that we don't even realize we're making it. Uh, it's really a part of almost everything in condensed matter physics. Uh, of course, it's a part of Fermi liquid theory, uh, as in Landau, Landau theory. It's also part of theory of superconductivity, where you have the Bogolyubov quasi-particles. Uh, even it's a part of theory of disordered metals, although it's not mentioned there. Now, sometimes people ask you, what's a quasi-particle? Well, people say, well, it's a pole in a Green's function. But for a theory of disordered metals, uh, that doesn't work, because, uh, because of disorder, there's no momentum is not conserved. Uh, and there's no Green's function that you can define ahead of time, which has a pole. You have to know the exact uh, solution of the problem to figure out which Green's function has a pole. So that's not a good enough definition. Uh, sometimes, so metals in one dimension you may know from what's called a Luttinger liquid, where there are no electronic quasi-particles. Uh, but that doesn't mean there aren't quasi-particles. There are collective modes of the Luttinger liquid theory. There's a boson, which is a density fluctuation or a spin fluctuation, which is a quasi-particle. It's essentially a free particle. And it also encapsulates all the states of the system. Just the electron is very hard to build out of the quasi-particles. <laughs> so even though the electron is not a quasi-particle, other things can become quasi-particles. That's what happens in one dimension. People call this a non-Fermi liquid. Well, that maybe depends what you mean by non-Fermi liquid. It's true that the electron is not a quasi-particle, but other things are quasi-particles. And even in the fractional quantum Hall effect, we have the Laughlin quasi-particle. So not the electron, but something else. So almost everything uh, that we study has a quasi-particle excitation. It can be quite complicated, but it's there. All right, so it would seem like they're always there. So we have to search hard for systems that don't have uh, quasi-particles, and in fact there are some systems, uh, and they're much more common than we thought. They seem to be appearing everywhere uh, in some studies of uh, strongly correlated materials, and, uh, and that was the origin of introducing the SYK model. All right, so let me first, before I define you know, a state without quasi-particles, let's define a quasi-particle. What do I really mean by quasi-particle? So I think formally this is the best definition that's far as I'm concerned that applies to every, every system I talked about. Uh, it takes a many-body system and find its many-body eigenstates. And you're only interested in the low-lying state, the ground state and a few excited states above the ground state. Uh, and I want to write down some the energy of these states. So if I have a system of n particles, n capital N over here, uh, then how many states have I got? Well, in any many-body system, the number of states is exponentially large. It's e to the n. It's really big, you know, e to the 10 to the 23. That's many states we're talking about. Even in an energy window of order 1 over n or anything, it's still a huge amount of states. Uh, and I want to write down those states in some simple way. So if a system has quasi-particles, the statement is, as Landau himself said in the beginning, or a Fermi liquid, that the energy is just the sum of the energy of a quasi-particle. So the defining property of a quasi-particle excitation is that it's additive. You can take two quasi-particles and create a new many-body excitation, which is just the sum of the two. Now, the energy of the composite state need not just be the sum of the energies. That's one term in the expansion. There can be some correction with a second term, or, or even higher-order terms. But there's just a few terms. And now the important point is that the number of labels of the quasi-particle is labeled alpha, is not exponentially large. It's of order n. n is the size of the system. You know, like the momentum, the number of values of the momentum of the quasi particle is n. It's not e to the n. So I'm, everything is about distinction between n and e to the n. 
Those are both large numbers, but one is much, much, much larger than the other. Uh, so, so the number of parameters in this energy expression is polynomial in n. Whereas the number of states, many body states, is exponential in n because that's the number of choices of n alpha. n alpha of a fermion is 0 or 1. And if alpha goes from uh, 1 to n, then the total number of choices is 2 to the n, which is a huge number. So the number of states I can describe with the polynomial number of parameters uh, is exponentially large. And therefore, that's what a quasi-particle is. It's a polynomial parameterization of an exponential number of states. Okay. <laughs> so that's, I think, uh, the, probably the most general definition, which applies to everything. All right. Uh, but this is not very useful because in a real experiment, nobody can ever measure these states. You can never measure things with that accuracy. How are you going to measure something with the accuracy e to the minus uh, you know, 10 to the 23? Probably. Or even if your system is a uh, thousand particles, e to the minus 1,000 is already ridiculously small. So you're never going to measure anything with that accuracy. So you never, this, this, is, this is just a pure theorist dream that you can do this. So what's a more practical definition? Well, the more practical definition comes up when you start thinking very generally in terms of uh, time-dependent phenomena. So the statement is that if you have a system which has quasi-particles, uh, it will, and you prepare it in some state with some set of quasi-particles. Well, each quasi-particle is kind of a lump that moves on its own. So it will take a long time for that system to equilibrate and settle down. The quasi-particles have to collide with each other, and once they collide, then they'll uh, eventually thoroughly equilibrate. And how long will this take? Well, Boltzmann taught her how to compute this thermalization. <coughs> you solve the Boltzmann equation for a weakly interacting classical gas, and he showed that for the for classical gas, this time is <coughs> the order of typical collision time. But that's also true for a quantum gas. You can write out the quantum Boltzmann equation and conclude the same thing. And you can just conclude, compute the thermalization time using Fermi's golden rule. Uh, and what you find is at the time, the divergence of the temperature goes to zero as one over temperature squared. And there's some energy square that has to appear here, which depends on all the interactions and other parameters. Okay. So in a Fermi liquid, this time is very large as temperature goes to zero as divergence of one over temperature squared. So that's another definition, but not yet precise. Uh, the definition of a system with quasi-particles is that it takes a long time to equilibrate because, you know, the quasi-particle, it's not sort of like a quasi-integrability. You have these excitations that uh, live for a long time, and that's why it takes a long time to equilibrate. Uh, so, but, but I haven't told you what is long. How long is this? Is this, how long is this time? What is the shortest possible time for something to equilibrate? Uh, okay, so to understand that, we have to understand systems without quasi-particles. Okay. So that's my introduction. Uh, what is a quasi-particle? Uh, and now I'm, I'm at the risk of boring you, I'm going to give you a simple example of a system with quasi-particles, um, which is in some sense exactly solvable. Uh, and that will allow me to finally introduce the SYK model, and then hopefully by time things right, I'll also say something about the high-temperature superconductors. So here is a very simple model of a system with quasi-particles. It's just free electrons to begin with. Uh, and I want to simplify life as much as possible. So I'm just going to take, uh, I'm going to, I don't want any extra symmetries. So I just take some random set of orbitals. It's just a random matrix model, really. And on these orbitals, I put n particles, that's some number of particles. So yeah, there are n sites, and I put q n particles. So q is the fraction of filling fraction. Uh, and then I allow these particles to move. So a particle can move from one orbital to any other orbital. This is not supposed to be space. But it has some amplitude and moves one by one. And every one of these uh, quantum processes, every one of these tunneling events, has some amplitude, which I just take to be a random number. That's, so that's, that's it. That's the model. Uh, and you can write it in the second quantized form this way. Uh, you have these... Uh, operators that anti-commute, uh, and these Tij are just Gaussian random numbers, 
I think that simplicity to have zero mean, and they're uncorrelated with each other. So the key thing here is independent. Uh, as long as they're independent, all of these models are basically the same problems. Okay. So this is a you know very simple problem to solve. You just take n squared random numbers, put them on a computer, diagonalize the n squared Hamiltonian, uh, n by n Hamiltonian, and then occupy the low infinity states. Okay. So you can do it numerically very easily for quite a large value of n, and a huge amount is known about such problems. It's just a random matrix problem. It originally was proposed as a model for nuclear, in nuclear physics by Wigner, and the eigen values of various Wigner dice and statistics. Uh, and the density of states uh, has obeyed the Wigner semicircle law. I guess it's the Wigner who discovered the semicircle law. So this is the density of states, uh, uh, just a semicircle density of states with some. So you occupy these are the occupied states and these are the empty states. Uh, and uh, this is quite easy to figure out where this comes from. You can just get it from by perturbation theory. So maybe I show that a little bit on the board. Uh, so, you know, if I put in the Green's function, G, it's just a free Green's function plus you scatter off the potential, plus you scatter twice off the potential, and so on. So this is just the Tij here. Uh, and then you average term by term. So when you average, this, this just gives you zero. When you average this, this gets paired up like this. These two have to be the same, same size. Uh, so this becomes like this, and then so on for the all the other terms, and you find that the full thing can be written as the full Green's function G uh, is equal to bare Green's function plus full Green's function here, full Green's function here, plus order 1 over n. So all other graphs vanish as n goes to infinity. Uh, and this is the this is, the, this is the entire solution of fiber graphs. Uh, and from this solution, you, you see you get exactly this equation. The self-energy is the Green's function. That's just, this is sigma right here. It's equal to the Green's function times e squared. OK. So now this is very easy to solve. Uh, it's just a quadratic equation for d. You take the imaginary part, and you get the semicircular law. Uh, so what's really happening here is there are single particle states. Uh, which are energy E sub alpha, and this is the density of states of these n single particle states, um, and the spacing between them is 1 over n. So, of course, this is the limit n goes to infinity, and you get some continuous spectrum. Uh, and this spectrum uh, is self averaging. The density of state is self averaging. In other words, uh, you just have to take one sample. You don't need to take infinite number of samples. They take one sample, as long as the matrix is large enough, you will see the density of states. Uh, so there are no fluctuations of it. They all suppressed by power of 1 over n. OK, now where there are fluctuations are in the spacing of these eigenvalues. And there's a huge theory of that which I won't really use. So that's the Wigner and Dyson random matrix statistics of the spacing of these eigenvalues. So we are not interested in that effect. Everything we talk about are, are self averaged quantities. Okay. All right, so I know you're all bored, but let's go on. So now let's just take the same problem uh, and think about it more carefully. So, what the, why this problem is so simple, what happened here, uh, is that it's really a many body, the Hamiltonian looks like a many body Hamiltonian, has two to the n states. But I can reduce it to diagonalizing to an n by n matrix because it's just free particles. Uh, and therefore, uh, however, let's just imagine I, I'm really dealing with a many body language. So let's just look at the energy levels. So, what's done here uh, is you take, a, in this case, just a 12 by 12 matrix. You diagonalize a random 12 by 12 matrix, you get 12 values of E alpha. And then you sum over n n alpha to get the energy levels of the many body states. So the number of levels of the many body states is 2 to the 12, which is 4096. And here are all the 4096 levels. So now you notice something very interesting. Uh, the total number of levels is 2 to the n. The bandwidth is n times the bandwidth, so it's n. 
So the spacing between the levels has to be on average 2 to the minus n. So they are very densely spaced. And here, as you go from one level to the next, what happens is that the n alpha change completely so that the one level happens to be accidentally close to the next one. Uh, and there's no relationship between one level and the next level. Just chaotically the n alpha moving around. Oh, but there's something very special on the bottom levels. The bottom levels are much more sparse. And this is why we have what's called the third law of thermodynamics. The entropy of the bottom level vanishes. Uh, and the reason they are sparse is because they're quasi-particles. So what happens here is the bottom level, it's very special. The ground state is the yellow states are occupied. What is the first excited state? The first excited state has to take one level from yellow and move it to, to the white. No matter which level I pick, I will have to pay an energy 1 over n, not e to the minus n. So it's quite a large energy. Uh, so that's why the bottom states are much sparser and the spacing is 1 over n. And this is the region that we can then describe up to some width of order 1 in the quasi-particle language, uh, even with interactions. Okay, so this is free particle, but you can check the same property board uh, when you put in interactions. Uh, and then you can also <coughs> compute this thing that I told you about. Uh, this equilibration time. So suppose I put in some weak interaction U I J K L. Uh, well, how do I compute the equilibration time? Well, just use Fermi's golden rule. Just look at the probability that a particle in state alpha hits a particle in state beta and gets scattered to an empty state gamma and an empty state delta. So just compute this uh, with these random numbers U I J K L. And because of the Fermi function, you'll find it closes t squared, and, and there's your 1 over t squared uh, uh, relaxation time from Fermi's order. Okay, <laughs> so I spent a lot of time on a very trivial model, just showing you the spectrum and uh, its relaxation time. Now let's do something more complicated, uh, and so I, I will introduce what's called the SYK model. And let me show you the pictures again. It's the same set of sites, and I occupy some fraction q of them. And now, instead of moving them randomly one by one, I move them randomly two by two. That's all. Uh, so, for example, this is a, this tunneling is allowed, or any other tunneling. You pick any pair of sites, uh, they can tunnel to any other pair of empty sites or orbitals or whatever you want to call these positions. Uh, and every one of these processes uh, is allowed and has some random amplitude. Just take them to be random numbers. Uh, and that's the SYK model. And what you see this is happening is because the electrons are moving together, uh, and these are quantum processes, uh, there's entanglement being generated. So every, every tunneling event generates some non-trivial many-body entanglement. And, and so this, this ground state of the system, in some sense, as you know, maximal entanglement, <laughs> uh, because uh, that's the only process that's allowed. There are no single body terms. And this turns out to be a toy model, and uh, I'll argue later of a strange metal, uh, and also a black hole. All right, so here's the model written out uh, explicitly. Uh, basically, uh, in fact, I already had in the previous transparency, it's, it's, it's these are the two body terms. You can go from site K and L to site I and J with the amplitude U, I, J, K, L, and these are all just random numbers. Uh, and that's it. This is the entire Hamiltonian. Uh, and this can be exactly solved in the larger limit, at least some aspects of it. Uh, and the 1 over n corrections are still being studied, but are now especially due to contribution of string theorists, are quite well understood. Uh, people are also interested in each of the minus n corrections, and this, that hasn't yet been understood fully, but there are papers on that every, second, every few days on uh, some of those corrections. Uh, and those corrections are due to quantum gravity, and that is I'm trying to explain to you. Uh, okay, so that's the model. Now, I should mention that this was introduced in nuclear physics, like the original matrix um, uh, single particle matrix model of Wigner and Dyson. It was called the two body random ensemble, uh, and there's even an RFP article in 1981, well before we started studying about it. I had no idea about any of this, 
uh, until some nuclear physicists told me about it recently. And I looked up those papers. Well, there's just a few papers, and they numerically diagnosed it uh, for some small systems, and that was it. Uh, that was the end of the story. And I asked, I talked to Lucas, well, why didn't you solve it? It's so simple to solve. Uh, well, this, you know, it's not as simple as you would think because in the 1970s and 80s, you know, even things like Grassman path intervals and replica methods and disorder averaging, those, are, those things were not known. So he said that's why they didn't use the path integral language mostly. Uh, okay, so let me show you how you can solve it in the larger limit. It, again, the arguments are very similar. Uh, you do exactly what you did. I did here for the one-body problem. For the two-body problem, uh, you have then uh, some you know, some mu here. This is the basic interaction I J K L, and then you have another mu here. In general, this is I prime J prime K prime L prime. But when you average over the U I J K L. Uh, Basically, these must be the same, otherwise you're down by one over n. So there's only one graph that contributes, that here j equals j prime, uh, k equals j prime, and l equals l prime, and i equals i prime, uh, after you average, and everything is down by a fourth of the terms of all the one over n. So, so the final uh, result is very similar uh, to the equation I wrote down earlier for the random matrix problem, here's the Green's function. In a random matrix problem, the sigma was g, t squared plus g, and now sigma is g cubed, that's all. Uh, and you can also look at the q-body um, model. This is the two-body interaction, you can look at the q-body model, and they all, so the, for if you have three-body interaction, this would be g to the fifth, and so on. Uh, and all of those higher q's, have properties similar to Q equals 2, the, the problem I'm showing you. Q equals 1 is special. It's the only one that has that, that very trivial quasi-particle picture. All the others don't. Uh, and this is the most robust one because it's the lowest order term uh, that gives you these non quasi particle effects. All right, so that's the set of equations. Uh, and uh, they can't be solved exactly. No one knows how to solve them exactly. Uh, we solved them in the low frequency limit at zero temperature, and then George and Parcolet showed us how to solve them at finite temperature at low frequency, uh, and then uh, Hitea pointed out more recently some extra symmetries, and uh, which then clarified the connection to quantum gravity. So amazingly, at some level, these ridiculously simple-looking equations have hiding in them the, some aspect of Einstein general relativity. <laughs> Hard to believe, but true. And I'm going to try to uh, show you why that's the case. Uh, okay. All right, well, first, let's just be very naive and try to solve this uh, the way we did in 93. Uh, so we just say, okay, uh, let's just imagine that at low frequency, there's some power law singularity. Um, so you can take your Green's function in some uh, in frequency space, have some z to some power, then you plug that back in here and you look for self-consistency uh, and you find that you can only have a solution of these equations. This is really very elementary type of spectral function arguments. Uh, if the zero frequency limit of the Green's function is exactly mu, so the zero, this must cancel that, otherwise there is no solution. So for any chemical potential, there is this exact cancellation that must happen. And then this must be one of us must be square root of frequency, and that has to be one over square root of frequency. And you can even get the value of A exactly. Uh, and what's not determined is the constant A, no, sorry, what's determined here, and there's a certain phase factor, uh, which I didn't write down. There's an E to the i theta that's not determined, uh, and that varies as a function of density Q. Okay, so there's this one over, so the Green's function diverges as one over square root of C. Uh, rather than just being a constant as it is in the Wigner uh, uh, Dyson case. Uh, and so this is some indication that there are no quasi particle excitations. All right, so, so that's the, the first solution uh, and then uh, that we had in 93. And then uh, you know, we published this paper and uh, 
only a few people paid any attention, and one of whom was Antoine George, and, we start, and he wrote a very nice paper with Olivia Partoulet, and then we started working on it together. And one of the things we understood, uh, it can be said, is that this model uh, has a non-vanishing limit of the entropy as temperature goes to zero. So, you know, this is in violation of what you call the third law of thermodynamics. And this disturbed us somewhat in those days. Uh, it's, and uh, maybe that's why most people lost interest in this model. But today we recognize this is in some ways not the most boring, but actually the most interesting property of this model is this entropy. Uh, and what does this mean? So, so first of all, I'm not saying that there's a ground state degeneracy. Now, I talked about ground state degeneracy earlier for the Tory code, and 4 4 degeneracy and so on. It's nothing like that. Uh, there's no degeneracy here. Uh, but there is an approximate degeneracy in the sense that there's a bunch of levels here near the ground state which have spacing e to the minus n s naught. And s naught is this number that we worked out, uh, some highly transcendental number which happens to be smaller than log 2. Uh, and so what that tells you is that if you look at the energy level spacing, in the middle of the band, like in the one, ba one random matrix theory, it's 2 to the minus n. And at the bottom of the band, instead of being 1 over n, uh, it's e to the minus n s naught, where s naught is smaller than log 2. So this spacing is much, much larger than this, because up in the exponent. So there's very much fewer states here than there are states here. The density is much smaller. But it's not that small. It's not as small as 1 over n. OK, so it's in between. Uh, and, and this is enough to give you a non-vanishing entropy. Now, you know, but, there's a, but in some sense, this, this entropy is very, very robust. You can, if you just take a single Hamiltonian, but take any set of random numbers, you'll find this many states. Uh, it self-averages, and you find this many states at the bottom of the band. Uh, also, you can take any uh, Hamiltonian you want with the UIJKL, and you can add uh, higher, you know, three-body terms and four-body terms and five-body terms. All of those terms you can add, and nothing will change. This number will remain the same. It's, exact, it's always exactly this. Uh, and so this should be contrasted with something like the ice entropy. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, Darrell, does it include basically three peaks and three peaks? Three peaks, meaning what? Three peaks. So I'm not talking about the three factors. There could be a certain independent three factors. Uh, so I'm not paying attention to that. But for my run on this, we actually have this value because this is a uh, complex fermion. This is what we computed originally, and my run number is exactly half. And, and even here, it's not log 2, it's log 2. They're both uh, drawn by factors of 2. So I don't know what you mean by the three peaks. So this is for the which you For the complex. Four points. It's for the four points. Four points, yes. So I'm saying if you have four point, six point, eight point interaction, you still get the entropy of the four point. It's only if the four point are exactly zero, then you'll get the entropy of the six point. So, and similarly, if you put in the two body interaction, I mean, the, not the two, the two body term, not the interaction, uh, the random matrix term, the TIJ, then this entropy will be lost. Then you've got to be back to one over n. So there's only one relevant perturbation, which is the single particle hopping. Single particle hopping is the only relevant perturbation. Now this is very different from the ice model. You know, falling as an ice model, where there's he talks about an entropy of ice, which is a different way you can arrange the water molecule in some crystal. But that entropy is for a very special interaction. It's only nearest neighbor of it. Doesn't care about long range coupling. And, and that, that, in fact, in that case, it's an exact degeneracy for the classical model. Any perturbation you can put, anything, quantum mechanics, longer range coupling, anything from that special Hamiltonian would lift the entropy. So that's highly, highly fragile. This is not fragile. <laughs> Almost only one thing will lift the perturbation, that single particle hopping. Nothing else will lift it. 
you know, it's quite robust. So that's something we have been appreciating more recently. It's actually quite a robust, and it's a very important property of this model. The fact that there are so many states of low energy, and it pretty much tells you right away that there are no quasi-particles, because there's no way you can take this many states uh, and write it in terms of a polynomial number of parameters down there at the very bottom. Uh, okay. uh, all right, so, so that's, so uh, I have not shown you the derivation of this S0, it's quite a complicated calculation, uh, and uh, well, you have to read some of the papers for that. <laughs> um, however, the most interesting property is this property right here. Uh, it's shown originally by George and Carcolet and more carefully uh, by us for non-equilibrium properties. Uh, if you ask the same question I asked for the for the quasi-particle system, how long does it take to equilibrate? What you find here, the equilibration time is universal. It's independent of you. It doesn't depend on you at all at low temperatures. It just depends on temperature, and that is constant. So people are calling this the Planckian time. Uh, and this is, you know, a consequence of this is some sense a critical theory where everything is described by some strong coupling fixed point. And the strong coupling fixed point, there are such strong interactions uh, that, uh, oh, sorry, there's a scale invariant structure of the interactions, and so the only scale of the problem is temperature itself. So there, there are other models that have this property, that the local equilibration time is h bar over kt. Uh, in fact, the simplest model, and probably the original model, has this property, uh, is the Ising model in 2 plus 1 dimension. You take the Ising model at its quantum critical point, and this is what's discussed in my book. Uh, Ising model at its quantum critical point in 2 plus 1 dimensions, uh, which is described by you know, very strongly correct in conformal field theory, uh, has this property that the equilibration time is just h bar over kt. Uh, the quark clone plot and the supersymmetric yang wells n equals 4 symmetric yang wells is also a strongly interacting to form field theory that also has this property as we know today. Uh, so basically, essentially, strongly coupled conformal field theories also have these properties. Uh, conformal field theories 1 plus 1 dimension don't because they're often integrable in some sense. Uh, but non integral conformal field theories have this property. So well, none of them are really solvable. They're very complicated. This one is solved. You can actually compute this number, at least numerically. You can, you can get this number by solving some non equations. And I'll try to give a little more indication of why this universality comes from, where it comes from. Uh, so this, so having found this, very, this h bar over kt equilibration, I can now answer a question I posed in the beginning of my talk. How rapid is rapid? Well, now that I've, we've studied this particular system of without quasi-particles, and people have studied many others, and they all have this property that the time is h bar over kt. Therefore, you can conjecture that any system with quasi-particles will take a line time that's parametrically larger than h bar over kt <coughs> as t goes to so in a Fermi liquid is 1 over t squared, in a disordered Fermi liquid is 1 over t to the 3 halves, and these are all uh, times that become much larger than h power over kt. So, so that's the, you know, the other definition, that absence of quasi-particle is fast thermalization, and now I'm giving you the lower bound, what the fastest possible thermalization? Well, it's in all the systems without quasi-particle that we know that have this, or they all have this problem. So this means that if somebody finds a system someday uh, that has tau equilibrium going as 1 over square root of temperature, well, then I don't know, I'll have to go back to the drawing board. But nobody's found such a system. Uh, and I think there's a good reason why they don't exist, because uh, you know, there's some kind of limit to how quickly the quantum systems can equilibrate. You know, classical systems have no such limit. I mean, h bar goes to 0, there's no limit. If you have a bunch of nonlinear springs, uh, you know, you ask how long do they thermalize? Well, you just, if you crank up the spring constant by a factor of 10, they all move factor of 10 faster, and they thermalize factor of 10 quicker. So, you, classical system can thermalize as quickly as you want, just by making the springs more and more, uh, more and more, 
rapid. But quantum mechanically, that doesn't work. Because quantum mechanically, if you crank up some couplings, what happens is that locally, you introduce a gap, which is proportional to the coupling. And that suppresses thermalization. Once you have a gap, then the excited state doesn't matter. So to get thermalization, you need lots and lots of low energy states. You need gapless continuous states, so they can scatter into each other very quickly. Uh, and that's hard to do. And once you get the scale invariant structure of these states, then temperature comes in at the time scale, uh, which limits how fast you can evolve. So that's the reasoning. OK. <laughs> uh, all right, so now I can introduce why these have to do with black holes. So let me just introduce very simple ideas on what is a black hole. There's only a few things you need to know. Uh, so black holes, of course, are solutions of Einstein's gravity. But Hawking, uh, in his most important contribution, uh, showed that black holes have an entropy that's proportional to their surface area. Uh, and they have a temperature called the Hawking temperature, which he computed to be this quantity. Now, however, we can also ask, how long does it take for a black hole to thermalize or to, to equilibrate? Now, we you know, we've all seen this famous simulation for the LIGO of, uh, detection. If you have two black holes which are spinning around each other, uh, they will then collide and eventually become one black hole, uh, which will very quickly come to rest and be a perfect sphere forever. And that perfect sphere that's sitting there uh, is a system in thermal equilibrium. That's what Hawking showed us. So then we can ask, how long does it, did it take for this black hole to become a perfect sphere? Well, there's a very last, so the two black holes merge, and then they vibrate a little bit and settle down. So the very last stage of it, which is called the ring down time, so the black hole a little bit vibrating and then it settles down. You can compute that ring down time just from Einstein's gravity. So a lot of people in black hole physics computed that, and they found that that ring down time, since there's no h bar here, it's purely gravity, is h by gm over cq. So that's the ring down time of black hole uh, to become a perfect sphere and sit there forever. Now, Hawking said, no, no, you should think of a black hole as a quantum system. Well, if it's a quantum system, then you can ask, well, what is the ring down time of, if it's a quantum system, that perfect sphere is actually a system in thermal equilibrium. Well, not quite, it's evaporating, but let's not worry about that. That's a much slower process. But locally in thermal equilibrium. Uh, well, uh, so what is the ring down time of this quantum system, which is in thermal equilibrium? Well, it just happened, to, you know, so the, the entire, the key thing now is to notice a numerical coincidence. The Hawking temperature is related to the ring down time by this very simple relation. So in fact, the ring down time of any black hole in any Bernoulli theory of gravity turns out to be h bar of the Hawking divided by the Hawking temperature. So a black hole, when you interpret as a quantum system, is a system that appears to equilibrate as fast as any other system. So, so for black, sorry. Then we know from the ABS CFP correspondence that at least in anti de Sitter space, we can think of black holes as equivalent to quantum systems in one lower dimension. Now, uh, so what does that mean here? Um, why is that useful? Well, so if a black hole in D plus one dimension is equivalent to a quantum system in these spatial dimensions, that immediately explains why they have a surface area of uh, entropy proportion to surface area. Because the surface area of the black hole is the volume of the quantum system, and every quantum system has an entropy proportion to volume. Even the SYK model has an entropy proportion to n, which is the volume. Uh, <coughs> so that's what it explains why it's surface area. And then this quantum system must be a system without quasi particles, as a as is the case for strong nature and the normal field theories and the SYK model. Uh, and, and therefore, that explains this time, this feature. So interpreted as a quantum system when equilibrates in the fastest possible time because it's a system without quasi-particles. Or if you think of it as a pure gravitational system, well, the temperature, the Hawking's formula for the temperature gives you the right equilibration time. All right, so, so that's really at the heart the key fact. The fact that black holes equilibrate at the time of order h bar over Hawking temperature is the reason 
that they could, if you want to think of the quantum system, they cannot be interpreted as a system, quantum system with quasi particles. This is no way. A quantum system with quasi particles cannot equilibrate that quickly. Okay. All right. So this, the, these features actually were uh, something I noticed already in 2010, well before anybody was. And nobody, I don't know, the number of people who read this paper is, I don't know, very small. Nobody noticed this. But anyway, I pointed out that because of all these similarities between the SYK model uh, and black holes, that you could think of the SYK model as dual to a higher dimensional black hole, which lived in ATD center space, ADS2, in fact, uh, with this kind of metric. And, uh, and that's basically. Now the connection that's pretty much been proven in a precise, much more precise way. Um, it was just a general conjecture that certain mean field capless spin liquid, that's precisely what are now called the SYK models, are equivalent to uh, this ADS2. And in fact, this S0 entropy, uh, this is a key observation in this paper, I think. This S0 entropy I just told you about is in fact the Hawking entropy of an extreme of black hole, which has a non-zero entropy at zero temperature. Okay. <coughs> All right, so, so that's the conjecture at the level of, you know, coincidence. You notice all these properties, they look exactly the same, so it seems very suggestive. But now, thanks especially to the work of Pitev, uh, we have a much more explicit, almost uh, constructive uh, way of seeing the connection. So let me briefly uh, indicate his arguments. So you remember these equations for the Dyson, for the Green's function of self energy, which have this solution as our square root of frequency. So what you, what turns out in this low frequency limit, this i omega term does not matter because its i omega is always smaller than square root of omega as omega goes to zero, and the mu gets cancelled out. So the Dyson, the Dyson equation is that G sigma equals minus 1. Very simple equation there. So you write this out uh, in time space, at two times. Sigma of tau 1 tau 2 is times G is minus 1. This is written out explicitly. And this equation is, of course, also very simple in time space. It's right there. Okay. So these are the low frequency limits of the equation that we saw uh, in 93. Now, these two equations, uh, as emphasized by Kitev, and to some extent, Antoine, George, and hopefully knew about this, uh, have a huge symmetry. Uh, so they have a symmetry of reparameterizations. So you can, just like in gravity, you can go from time tau to time sigma, you reparameterize time, and you just rescale the Green's function, the self energy, by some power of the reparameterization. They transform covariantly in some way. Uh, and then you plug this back in, and the new functions g tilde and sigma tilde you can check have the same equations as sigma and g. Now they are functions of sigma two times sigma one and sigma two, but the physical solution is only a function of tau one minus tau two. So when you do this transformation, if this is a function of tau one minus tau two, the right hand side is not a function of sigma one minus sigma two. So these extra solutions are not very physical, but they're there. And they will have to be accounted for, however, when you do the fluctuations. So there's an infinite number of solutions of these equations, and there's this reparameterization symmetry in the low energy limit. So there's an emergent symmetry of reparameterizations. And that's, you know, first hint that there's something to do with gravity, because gravity is also reparameterization invariant under space time transformations. So this is only time. Okay. Another observation of Kitev is that. The physical solution, which I call g sub s and sigma sub s, uh, is some power law of time. Now, this solution, as I told you, is not reparameterization invariant, because if you reparameterize it, you know, tau 1 minus tau 2 becomes f of tau 1 minus f of tau 2, and that's not a function of tau 1 minus tau 2 once you reparameterize time. Uh, however, there is a set of f's for which that's true, and those set of f's where this tau 1 minus tau 2 basically comes back to itself, are the f's which are fractional linear transformations. These transformations. And this is, these f's are called the group SL2R. So what you have is that you have a theory uh, which has the path integral is reparameterization invariant, but the saddle point spontaneously breaks it down 
to SL2R. Okay. So this is suspiciously like what happens for ADS2. So the theory, if you write down the Einstein-Maxwell theory, it has deep parameterization invariance. But the vacuum solution, so no, ordinary Einstein theory is deep parameterization invariant. Uh, but our vacuum, which is a Minkowski vacuum, is only invariant of Poincaré transformations. So in some sense, the vacuum here is breaking the transition variance down to uh, Poincaré. So what happens in ADS2 is the analog of the Poincaré group is SL2R. So this, this is the metric of SL, uh, ADS2. And you can verify that if you do an SL2R transformation, this metric goes back to itself. That's really the defining property of anti decision space this invariance of the SL2R transformation, which is the conformal group in one plus one dimension. Uh, so, so, that's, so there's the, so, so what we find there, therefore, that the theory of gravity in one plus one dimensions with an ADS2 vacuum has exactly the same symmetries as the S low energy properties of the SYK model. And everything I've written down here are very easy things to verify. I mean, I've pretty much shown you how to verify this. All the equations are here. It's really elementary. And, and these are just state, elementary statements about this metric. So the symmetries are exactly the same. And that's roughly why I now, of course, there's much more sophisticated analysis by Kitev uh, uh, and then Manda Singh and Stanford and Witten and Stanford and Borlinde uh, and a whole bunch of other people who made this connection. Uh, much more precise, but I won't say more about it. Okay. All right. So, uh, how am I doing on time? Ten minutes. Okay. All right. So, let me say then, finally, you know, get to the topic of my colloquium. How do I build a strange metal out of it? So, first I have to tell you what is a strange metal. Uh, well, so for example, in YBCO, uh, if you look at the phase diagram as a function of x, or p in this case, uh, and temperature, uh, there's a whole mess of phases uh, that we're not interested in right now. Uh, there's this phase here, which is the strange metal. And if you measure the resistivity of this phase, uh, it increases linearly with temperature. Uh, I've shown this here for another high temperature superconductor. Uh, which is the iron nickel high temperature superconductor. So here again, this X is the, the electron concentration in temperature. There's a whole mess of phases here, but there's this regime here where the resistivity uh, has this exponent alpha is close to one. So resistance is increasing linearly with temperature. Uh, in this region, you get the alpha close to two, and that's the T squared from the liquid resistivity. So what does this do? So I think there's universal agreement today that the only way you can understand this phase is in a, more, in a system without quasi-particle excitations. Uh, the resistivity can become very large, but still increases as you increase the temperature, which is also very mysterious because normally there's something called the mark of the regal limit, that if you make a system very dirty, uh, eventually so that the resistance becomes larger and larger and larger. Once it becomes larger than h over e squared in two dimensions, once the resistivity becomes larger than for a two-dimensional system rather than 27 kilo ohms, then it becomes an insulator. It just shoots off the infinity. And an insulator has the property that as you increase the temperature, the resistivity goes down because you excite more and more particles above the gap and things start moving. Here the resistivity goes up and it's much larger than what your legal limit in some cases. So there's just no simple way to understand that in any quasi-particle. All right, so what's happened recently is that, and some, some of it is not so recent, in fact, this idea goes back to Jordan part of A. So we now have models that we can solve in the large n limit, which look like strange or bad maps. And they have models like this. So they did, what you do is you take the SYK model and put it on this island. So think of this as some big atom. And now the sites of the SYK model, which are these colored dots, are uh, various orbitals. So say, you know, for example, in the iron nictides, uh, there's the D shell, which has got five orbitals. Uh, and then there's also spin up and down. So there's 10 states. So we're going to send 10 to infinity. Uh, so we just have n states here on each atom or island. 
and then there's some hopping from one island to the next. So these are nearly degenerate states for the single particle sector, but they have some uh, interactions, uh, and then there's the hopping, which can actually also be not just nearest neighbor, but on site too. You can also have some splitting between them. So the only, amazingly, this model turns out to be exact, it's a strongly interactive model, which is exactly solvable in the limit where the number of orbitals become large. And really the only assumption is that as n goes to infinity, you have to scale the u's and the t's in this manner. So you are on 1 over n cubed here and 1 over n there. Uh, and that's it. Uh, actually, this model is also solvable without this order. You can take the same t between every pair, and you can take the same u between every, on every side. So notice now the colors are the same on every island, exactly the same. Whereas here, the colors are different on the different islands. So this is a model with randomness, and this is a model without randomness, and they have basically the same properties. And the hope is that even in n equals 1, the ordinary Hubbard model, which is like n equals 1 or 2, uh, is basically, has a regime that looks exactly like this. So we can't solve the ordinary Hubbard model at these finite temperatures, but you can solve this model as n goes to infinity. So this particular model was solved by uh, Song et al., Shu Yang Song and Xiaoming Liang and Liang Dallas. Uh, and this is, for example, the resistivity as a function of temperature uh, above some coherent scale, which turns out to be T squared over U. So if the interactions are strong, U is very large, this is actually very low energy scale. So when you go below energy scale EC, that's shown over here, the resistance is T squared. Okay, so the resistivity is T squared down there, and the entropy vanishes linearly as in any Fermi liquid. So down here you get you recover a Fermi liquid with T squared resistivity. But you have this bad metal behavior where the resistance keeps increasing even though it's much bigger than H over E squared. Uh, and it's the fact that it's linear in temperature is not some trivial thing. It's really a consequence of this one over square root of omega spectral function. Uh, of the SYK model. Uh, it's very much using the two-body form of it and the form of critical structure of it. Uh, okay, so, so that's then a theory of a strange metal. And then uh, people have also looked at the one, have, but this model, however, goes to, you know, Fermi liquid behavior at low temperatures, which is not what you see at the critical point anyway. Uh, here's another model where you take two bands where you have SYK islands interacting with actinian and fermions. Uh, I think I'm running out of time. And here there's no disorder, so it's an SYK condo model with no disorder. And this turns out to have two different regimes of uh, resistivity. Uh, one which is incoherent, where resistivity is much larger than H over E squared. And the other, which is marginal Fermi liquid like, again linear in T, but much smaller than H over E squared. <coughs> And also has some very interesting magneto resistance properties, uh, which are similar to uh, those that are seen in these experiments of analytics. Uh, I should remove that talk by the <coughs> All right, so I, I think I'm running out of time, so I won't go into these exper experimental details. Uh, the bottom line is that, starting from this very simple, ridiculous toy model, uh, people are now building many different ways, lattice models, and they seem to have very appealing, this turns out a very appealing starting point for understanding not just disordered random system, strongly interacting system, but even uh, non-random strongly interacting systems. Okay, so let me just conclude. Uh, I'm going to skip all of this. Right. So these are the basic properties of the SYK model that it equilibrates in the time h bar over kt, and this gives you kind of a lower bound for equilibration time. Uh, for any quantum system with quasi particles, or, which is saturated. So, yeah, so this is the, I guess I've already said these things and then they put it up. So, the lattice models, they can have resistivity bigger than h over e squared. The quantum models can have resistivity smaller than h over e squared. And there's some gauge theories I didn't talk about, which have other strange powers. In some combination of these, we hope will help us eventually understand. Uh, the strange metal that's very much work in progress. So, thank you very much.